Legal and Reg has worked on insurance issues for two decades, and in the past, our approach had primarily been a little combative. You know, it, so we I was brought in, actually I'm a litigator, so I was brought in to work on lawsuits against insurance companies. And one of the things I know as a litigator is the slowest and most expensive way that you could possibly resolve any issue is by a lawsuit. And we've done it and we remain ready to do that and we have several com administrative complaints out against companies not here today. Um, but we found recently that the fastest and most effective way to get things done often is a collaborative approach. For example, just a few months ago we had an issue that was just burning up the listservs and we sent an email at four o'clock on Friday to one of our contacts at one of these companies. An hour later we had a response which was pretty much the response our contact wasn't the main person handling that, but he said, I'll have the person who's responsible for this issue get back to you on Monday. Monday morning, we had a detailed response assuring our members that the contractor for the insurer who had sent that out had gone a little bit overboard. And in fact, this was really meant as just an educational approach to people and stuff like that. So we can get, when you get pro can get problems resolved that fast, it's a better way of doing things. And it was you know really a good, Benefit for, benefit for our members. We think that this collaborative option may have opened up because of a changed dynamic. As you'll hear a fair amount about today, you know, ample evidence shows that behavioral health interventions that psychologists can offer are critical to meeting the goals of healthcare reform, better outcomes, higher patient satisfaction, better patient engagement, more cost efficient. This has shifted the dynamic. Enlightened insurers, like the ones we have here today, have moved from viewing psychologists as a cost to being controlled to being a vital solution and a resource for meeting these goals. Enlightened insurers also see psychologists both outside and within the company as experts at assessment and measurement, making collaborative systems work, improving patient engagement and satisfaction. And these are skills that enlightened companies realize are very important to making healthcare work, making it really, as Ron say, be, be about the people involved, be about the patients. And so we've had, like I mentioned, we've had, in addition to the one I talked about that we resolved very quickly, we've had a number of issues that we've been able to collaboratively resolve very quickly. Um, one of our speakers is from Optum, and they've recently helped us resolve a number of issues in three different states, as well as some national concerns we've had. And we hope to start a project w very soon with AmeriHealth to expand access to psychological services right here in DC with the help of Epstein Becker and the DC Psychological Association. So let me introduce our panelists. Um, I want to thank our insurance representatives, Lourdes Hattridge from Optum. She is the uh, National Director of Peer Review and is, as those of you who haven't worked with insurance a lot, keeping track of who's with who is, is sometimes a tricky. Optum is related to UBH, which a lot of people know, and is part of United Healthcare. And then Karen Dale is the market president for AmeriHealth Caritas, am I pronouncing that correctly? District of Columbia. Now, those of you with you know, good sensibilities realize you should just trust a lawyer on these things. So we're gonna start you off by having Vince Belwar, who is the uh, president of Springfield, uh, Association of Springfield Psychological and former president of the Pennsylvania Psychological Association, tell you about his experience as a psychologist working collaboratively with insurance companies. Good morning. So I'm, I'm not going to spend much time up here, uh, but as Alan asked, uh, I guess this works, Alan. Um, yep. Uh, I just want to tell you my experience is working with some insurers as a as a uh, owner of a large group practice. Um, our practice is based in southeastern PA in the Philadelphia area, in the surrounding suburbs. Um, right now, we've grown quite a bit. We do about 9,000 treatment sessions a month. We are multidisciplinary. We have psychiatrists, psychologists, uh, social workers, LPCs, licensed professional counselors, and uh, nurse practitioners. Most re recently, we've grown to about 20 locations. Of those 20, uh, 14 are primary care physician offices where we're co-located in, seven outpatient sites, and uh, 
we were always getting into different schools and doing different programs in there. Um, the most exciting news we have is uh, we were close to inking a deal with a major hospital system. They were asking us to get into 30 of their primary care physician practices. I was at the meeting with my, uh, my partner, and they said, can you, can you staff 30 of our offices? And he just, yes, of course. I was kicking the table. I'm like, yeah, maybe. Um, and uh, so we'll have to do that. So we, we've grown quite a bit, and one of the one of the ways that we've grown quite a bit is we have gotten better and better relationships with the insurance companies. And um, so here's some simple steps we did to, to improve those relationships. First, we asked them what they wanted, how to improve services. Um, we worked on developing programs that, again, they wanted. Not what we thought was important, but what they wanted. And I was, I was thinking this morning, it's, if you ever read, um, about how to market yourself, you know, marketing 101, that um, customers really don't care too much about degrees um, and your specialized training. They want to see the results. What will you, what will you do? Well, insurers are this, kind of the same way. What will you, for, we've asked them, to, what do you guys need us to do to provide better services? And we've had a great relationship with that. Now, uh, they've been very clear with us about that. Um, and in doing that, too, obviously we've gotten large, but what I've noticed is you can even do this if you're much smaller, if you're willing to collaborate with others at uh, maybe a practice down the street or, or the next town over. Um, there is not as much concern about banding together and, and uh, perhaps colluding, especially if uh, you're doing something to help control health care costs or meet the needs of the provider. Um, so. Is there a concern with you banding together with others or colluding with someone? Not if you're trying to bend the curve, the healthcare cost curve, which is out of control. One of the things we've talked about and we've been able to uh, certainly uh, benefit from, and we ask them, you know, give me, give me some incentives to do these, these uh, programs. And for example, with Aetna, uh, being in the PCP offices, Aetna offers a, a separate billing code the pay is slightly higher, 15, 20% higher to perform that same service in the PCP office that I do in my office, a 90834 or 37. So 992242 is that code that Aetna does, and it's great. It allows me to you know, uh, pay, get, pay a little bit more for PCP work because it's very difficult and costly. Um, and now the goal is can we convince some of the other insurers to do that too. Outcome measures. Um, with my work with PPA, we brought together a couple of the major insurers, about five or six of them, in Harrisburg, and we talked about outcome measures about three, four years ago. A great talk about why, although the insurers want outcome measures, why we as providers had a really hard time implementing that, especially when you have Optum has one, and Magellan has another, and Aetna has a third, and Highmark has a fourth. How can we as providers figure out what to give? Um, it was very interesting, but we had, uh, the Medicaid provider there too, and she sort of chastised the other uh, insurers and said, if you want providers to use outcome measures, you have to incentivize them, you have to pay them. And they do that on the Medicaid side in Philly. Uh, but that led to Aetna beginning to roll out a piloting program where they're paying us to do outcome measures. Um, each time we do one, we get paid 10 bucks. Every little bit helps. Lastly, we're working with Aetna, and I'll talk about this towards the end, but our value-based contract, and that's where it's morphed too. Let me go back to our goal, though, is to be part of this bending the cost curve, to create not just a healthier customer mental health-wise, but a, a, a healthier consumer role in terms of everything, in, in terms of their medical. And that, I believe, gets us a seat at the decision table, if you would. Um, the other thing that gets us at the table, of course, is using data as evidence. And this is what I, I found is important. Make sure it's data they're interested in, and not what you're interested in. I've seen this happen. I've seen other large groups do this. They bring this wonderful data that they've done all on their own. The insurers really don't care about that. So find out what they're interested in and provide them that data. Um, and that way, we partner with them more. And then maybe partner is too strong of a word, but our aim is to partner with them so that psychologists become on par with the medical side, especially with payments. That'd be nice, huh? 
And we're trying, and I want to really thank uh, Shirley and Alan and Connie for helping PPA do that and, and really fight and advocate for getting our payments on par with, with medical. And we're having some discussions with IBC about that right now in terms of 90837s. Um, and lastly, my, the goal, of course, is if we can bend the health care curve, especially with our PCP work, where we create a healthier consumer, there's going to be cost savings, or at least we'll bend the curve. Well, I, I strongly prefer that that savings go into our pockets, too, as well as everybody else. And as we continue to talk to them and beg them for it and harass them more, we do that again and again and again. And sooner or later, they begin to listen to some degree. So in courting the payer, what works? Size. Being multidisciplinary, of course, that gets very much their attention. I was talking to Ron, I uh, hope he'll be presenting later today. In New York, they can't hire psychiatrists there, which is antiquated to say the least. But there are ways, if you can, to partner with people like psychiatrists. You get psychiatrists on your staff, or in some way a collaborative relationship, uh, insurers begin to listen a lot more to you. And we've used that, uh, our, our, we use our psychiatrists, have them on staff, to be able to negotiate higher rates uh, for our clinicians. Um, can't do it just clinicians alone, but you can get their attention with psychiatrists. So uh, and some of these, these um, bullet points here are from um, when I spoke to Tony Rokino at Aetna, I said, I'm, I'm going to present down DC. What do you want me to tell these, these folks from your perspective? And Tony's the head of uh, Aetna's Behavioral Health Division. And he said, well, here's a couple of things. He said, access. More than anything else, it's about access patients have. And what was this quote? He said, you know, you get, tell these folks their lack of referrals isn't our problem. It's your problem. And what do you mean, Tony? He said, I hear again and again from customers, from, from consumers, that they can't get a call back. They call somebody. No one picks up the phone. So they'll call someone else to pick up the phone. And so when providers complain to me, you're not sending me referrals, his response is, if you pick up the phone, you'll get them. <laughs> oh, and of course, good customer service. That goes without saying, but the amount of complaints he gets about poor customer service um, is, is, he said, fairly significant. So those two things, just having access, having someone pick up a phone. And this is where even as a solo provider, you can, of course, work with other groups to have a sort of call center or, or, or you know, a secretary shared between practices. Listen, I know this is a big shift for a lot of people. If you, if you run a large group, it's easier because you have the people there. But just because you're in solo practice or a group of two or three, get out of those silos, start coordinating with others about how we can together provide better access, the better care. Uh, data mining is, is huge. Uh, what was Tony's uh, uh, quote? He said, uh, you know, psychologists see themselves as part artist, part scientist. And you may be providing the best type of service out there, but unless you can prove it to others, people don't know. And prove it to the insurer, too. This is why when you have an EA or, uh, EHR, learn, how to, learn to mine some of that data and provide some of that data to say, yeah, I'm doing a pretty good job. Of course, PCP integration is something that everyone's really hot about. Very difficult to do, but it's possible. My belief is I'd rather stay independent of working for a hospital so that uh, I can provide those services as a third party versus working for the hospital. I also have found that, and this is with due respect for those who work in hospitals, hospitals do a lousy job with providing outpatient mental health services. They just don't know how to do it very well. And that leaves an opportunity for us, for psychologists especially, to provide that service. And you see this happening all on the medical side, too. In, our, in Philadelphia area, you have cardiology consultants who are an independent group of cardiologists, and they hire out their services to all the hospital systems. It's being done, so why can't we do that with psychologists? And although I employ LCSWs, LPCs, and I think I saw Jeff somewhere in the audience who also runs a large practice in the Philadelphia area, there's about 25 large practices. The great majority of those are run by psychologists, and there's a reason for that. Okay, obviously a few other things Tony talked about, moving to telemedicine if you could. They're very interested, Aetna is, in doing that. Uh, adjunctive e-therapy. And last thing he said was always run your practice like a business. 
especially know the numbers. You got to be good with numbers. A lot of group practice leaders I find are not. If you're not, that's fine, but find someone who's good. I think it helped that I always love math. That helps a lot. So the admin value-based contracting, two quick slides on what I do with Aetna right now. Aetna's trying to roll this out to, well, their goal was to have 75% of uh, their mental health providers at some level do value-based contracting. Basically, it's this. If you meet these criteria, these ones right here, those ones right there, I'll come back to these. If you meet these, you get a pay raise next year. Okay, we got 5% increase because we did these things. Timely access, like we said before, if, if you know the, um, what's that called, the, uh, not the HIPAA, the uh, HEDIS, I mean, HEDIS standards, yeah. If you can get people in quickly, great, they love it, especially out of a hospital, they love it. Um, EHR, this is the criterion. Do you have EHR? Yes? Okay, hit that criterion. Evidence-based assessment tools, we're talking low-hanging fruit here, we're talking about nothing too complicated. But do you use something? Aetna said again and again what they're interested in. It's just use something. Use anything just to measure because they find people don't, psychologists, uh, mental health workers, don't use any type of measure. They just want you to see using something. It's your choice. Um, medical collaboration. Could be integration, co-location. Could be simply that you communicate back to the physician when they refer someone to you. Uh, there's a lot to be said about this, but Edna's pushing it. If you show that you do that with Edna patients, you've met that criteria. Click that off. Appropriate psychiatric referrals. This is where, this is where you want to have that relationship with the psychiatrist. Um, and this is nice about being a larger group too. It allowed me to sit at the table with Tony's about two years ago and say, okay, he said, well, we think if someone comes through and gets diagnosed by one of your clinicians as having major depressive disorder. Um, we think they should see a psychiatrist within 10 days. I said, well, is that 10 business or 10, 10 uh, <laughs> calendar days? And I also said, Tony, no one's gonna meet that requirement. No one at all. I mean, I have a lot of psychiatrists right now about 10 or 11, and I can't meet that. Um, so we push it out to 15 days. But still, it's very, very difficult. Um, to do because of the dearth of psychiatrists. That's why we hired now three CRN, uh, clinical nurse specialists. But the idea is get them in if they have the appropriate di MDD, that's, that's the only thing they're shooting for, a major depression diagnosis, have them screen for that. But then you get into little things like, well, if they're coming from their PCP and they're already on an SSRI, do we need to see psychiatrists? And you have these discussions with them. And Tony's response was, yeah, but you know, don't you think they should have a real specialist take a look at them too? Well, maybe, okay. But then I thought, well, we have an EHR, Tony. What if they're really happy with it and it seems to be working? And what if I can show you that they're on the meds through their PCP, they've been, we suggested they see the, the psychiatrist and they said, no, I'm fine with that. We check off that box, it counts. So this is sort of the, the partnering, the working with them and they're okay with that. Interesting one, follow up with those who leave treatment early, those who prematurely leave treatment. What does that mean? This is, it was a terrific conversation about who defines that, Tony? You got, how are you guys gonna define what premature leaving treatment is? And he basically said, you guys do that. And we talked about it and he said, well, if you know someone who's not continuing treatment and they should because they're gonna get worse, what does that mean worse? Well, worse really means they're gonna be more, they're gonna be more costly. They're gonna have to the ER more, they're gonna get their PCP practice more, that's gonna cost more. So go after them. How do you go after them? Two contacts with them. What do you mean contacts? Phone calls, text, email, whatever works to show you have two contacts with them. Great, meet that criterion. And he almost apologized for this next one, the consumer satisfaction survey. He said, this department over here wants to show something about, we're reaching out to consumers and asking them, if you ever done this before, you know if you ask uh, clients, You'll get two extremes, those who love you and those who hate you, and not too many people in the middle. But they don't care, they just wanna see you reach out and try to get some consumer feedback. And the last thing is the average length of care, uh, average book of business, and are you within one standard deviation? One standard deviation is pretty wide when you have eight to 10 sessions, so it tends to be very easily met unless you're a high duty specialty practice that works with eating disorder or something like that. 
So uh, that's all I want to talk about, just my work with Aetna, specifically how it's been a very good collaborative relationship. Started by getting large, started by calling them and calling them and contacting them, and then ultimately, how can I help you guys solve your problems? So I'll pass it along. Thank you.